I want us tonight to talk about many tabernacles, two temples, and one church. Uh, should be a very interesting study, and uh, you'll understand why it is entitled this as, as, we, uh, progress in the, as we progress in this study. As far as introducing this study, we need to understand in every age, God has designed and directed worship. That's an underlying principle. If you start and think about it, if, if I read from uh, Genesis to, well, not from Genesis to Revelation, but from Genesis to maps, that's reading all the Bible. And uh, you know what you'll decide? God is in charge of worship. And while that's not the importance of the, that's not the emphasis of tonight's lesson, that needs to be remembered. God, can you, can you finish this verse? God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. A good question to ask others, by the way, when they talk about the matter of worship, say now, the Bible shows that truth is found in the Bible. All, you know, the Spirit will guide you into all truth. I know how you think you ought to worship, but we must worship Him in truth. Where the, does the Bible give you that right to worship God that way? That's a principle, isn't it? And that's why we begin the study by saying, God is the, is the one who is, is to be worshiped, and he's the one who determines. It is in, it's somewhat parallel, and we say this for the benefit of those who may uh, have had some problem in their marriage or some, some newlywed people. You need to remember what your wife wants for a Christmas present or what she wants for an anniversary. Uh, there was a lady in the church in Atlanta that uh, one time for a Christmas present, he bought her a dictionary. Well, that's, uh, that's not a good gift. I don't, don't know. I mean, uh, uh, and so she finally decided, her husband made a lot of business trips, and so she decided that every time he went on a business trip, the business trip fairy would go out and buy her a present. And so whenever uh, they came home from the business trip, uh, uh, she showed him the present the business trip fairy had brought and the bill the business, the business uh, trip fairy had brought to, to, uh, uh, for him. And you might check with Judy about a gospel meeting fairy that uh, visits our house a lot of times. But... Uh, the, re the receiver of the gift determines the gift. And you need to understand that, and that's particularly true in the matter of, uh, in the matter of worship. Here's, here's a quick outline of where we're going to head tonight, and so you'll understand. We're going to talk about worship of God from the time of Cain and Abel to Noah till the time of Moses. Now, well, I want to come back to that in just a minute, and let's, just, uh, let's go ahead and buzz and just leave that. Well, you go ahead and put the second slide up, if you like. Do not, I mean, the yes. And, and that is, then we want to talk about worship of God from the time of Moses until the time of the New Testament. Now, we've got several sub-points on that, and, and we'll come back to those and look at those in detail. But there, there is a third one, and Buzz, if you want to go to, I've lost a slide, uh, count of, uh, of the, num the numbers on the, on the slide, but the, uh, uh, well, you can't put the next one up. Well, don't, don't give them the clues about, just take that one down. They'll know what the whole lesson's all about tonight. Don't, don't try to read that. We're going to talk about the third one when it's time to get to the third one. I, I thought I had this thing laid out a whole lot better than, uh, than I did. Let's go back to talk about Cain and Abel's. How did you worship God? 
if you were Cain and Abel, how would you have worshipped God? Isn't that amazing? Now, you have an idea of what worship is because you live on this side of Revelation. They're on the front side of Revelation. How do you worship God? Well, pagans, you know, offer human sacrifices, do they not? You know, if you, don't, if you don't have a revelation of how to worship God, you've got to think up some way to worship God. Have you seen those individuals who uh, in the Philippines literally are nailed to a cross? Ever seen that particular procession in time that uh, uh, those individuals who, are, who, who believe they want to do what God wants them to do, they, they, uh, they literally are nailed to a cross and suffer during Easter. How'd you figure that out? Is that what God wanted? No. In the absence of revelation, we would have no way to know. And the difference in Cain and animal sacrifice was not one being a blood sacrifice and the other not being a blood sacrifice, though there is some reason to, uh, uh, to at least consider that as a possibility. The reason one was accepted and the other one was, was rejected, Hebrews chapter 11 in verse 4 says, Abel's sacrifice was by faith. What does that imply? Cain's sacrifice was not by faith. What does that mean? Can you know, you know this verse, Romans 10, 17? Faith comes from hearing the Word of God. What did Abel do that Cain did not do? Abel heard the word of God and did what God said. And Cain did not. I'm confident, you know, knowing the justice and the fairness of God, that Cain had the same instruction. But it is Abel who walked by faith. And Cain just thought, well, since I'm a farmer, I can, I can bring the fruits of my own hand and offer them to God. And then you've got Noah. Noah comes out of the ark. What does he do? He offers animal sacrifices. Where did he get that? Well, wouldn't it be possible that he would know something about the story about Abel's sacrifice being an acceptable to God? And who knows what other revelation there had been given by God up until that time. And it ascended up into heaven as a sweet smelling savor. What about the sacrifices of Abraham? And the altars that Abraham built and that Isaac built. It's all by the matter of revelation. And, and it, they're doing what God says. And that's the point we're trying to make it is an underlying principle about all of this. And that is, it was, they, they, it was done by faith. But whenever you get to uh, uh, Mount Sinai, it begins to change. Worship, evidently, from uh, the time of Adam until the time of Moses, was a family kind of worship. Job offered sacrifices for the sins that his sons may have committed. You got a picture? It's not just necessarily a personal sacrifice. It was a father offering a sacrifice for his sons. And the, and the word for father is patriarch. And so we call that age the patriarchal age. That's not a biblical way, a biblical way to describe it. For the Bible does use the word patriarch twice. It's first applied to the sons of Jacob, those 12 patriarchs. And then in Acts chapter 2, uh, David uh, 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 is called a patriarch. Well, he doesn't fit the patriarchal age. But if you're going to describe that age, what are you going to talk about it? Well, it's the age which the fathers were, were the, the head of the worship. And so we call that age from Adam until Noah a patriarchal age. You get to Moses, and there's a new way. There's a national religion, not family, but national religion. 
And so that's a, that's a drastic change. Now then, have a national religion, you've got to have a priest. You've got to have somebody to offer the sacrifice. Your father's not going to do it. And it's rather ironic that had not the golden calf incident occurred, those who would have been the priest in the Jewish dispensation were the firstborn. God had originally planned for the firstborn to be the priest. But whenever the events, the events happen at Mount Sinai, he then rejects the firstborn because the Levites remain faithful to, to God. And so God then honored the Levites because they then were the ones who became the priest inside the Old Testament system. And so uh, uh, one of the reasons they took the census was to find out how many, uh, how many firstborn there were of each of, of, uh, uh, of all, of, well, no, that, that's, uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the wilderness, they counted the first census, they counted how many firstborns there were and how many Levites there were, and, and uh, whatever the difference was, they, they offered sacrifices to, uh, to, to make up that difference. But it was a national religion. And there was a temple that was involved in it. We're going to spend a lot of time looking at that tabernacle and then later at, uh, at that temple. But uh, uh, let's, let's get to this matter of this first tabernacle having been built. Uh, we'll come back and talk about it in detail, but let me just make some observations. And that is that when you get to the matter of tabernacles, there were many tabernacles. Otherwise, well, let me ask you, you ever have a family tent you've taken for your family? How long does that last? What about your house? How long does it last? I think it, 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 I think it is ironic that there were many tabernacles, and we'll have some verses to to show this a little bit later. But David, when David is ready to build the temple, he wasn't allowed to do it. But when David is ready to build the temple, uh, David says, you've gone, or God says, uh, you've gone from tent to tent to tent, from tents to tents. And now we're going to build a house for my name's sake. God, God said that. And so if you stop and think about it, that tabernacle was in the wilderness for 40 years. They brought it in the promised land. They first had it at Gilgal, and it was there for a long time. And then it was brought by, by David. It was brought up to the city of Jerusalem, and that's where, that's where, the, that's where the tabernacle, or where the, where the temple uh, was, was, later, was later built. And so uh, the temple was planned by David. We'll show some verses about this in a minute. We'll come back and look at, in more detail in this. It was all planned for David. He gathered the materials for that. And uh, the temple was actually built by Solomon. There was a second temple that was built, and we're going to go back and amplify this later in this lesson, after they come back from Babylonian captivity. So we've got the tabernacle that exists from the time it was built in, uh, at Mount Sinai, and then it was replaced by other tents, movable tents. And finally, David comes along, and then David gathers the, the material to build the permanent building. And so we got the first tabernacle, first temple. What happens to it? Well, Solomon builds it. And, uh, you know, uh, 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 Solomon's from about 970. So Solomon builds that but that first building, how long does that uh, last? I, I said seven, uh, 970 is when that was built. And, uh, and then Nebuchadnezzar comes and destroys that tabernacle, destroys that temple. You remember Daniel over in Babylon? He goes to his window and he prays and he looks at the direction of the temple. Of the temple. It was not there. So the first thing they do when they get back from Babylon in captivity is to build a second temple. And Zerubbabel is the one who built that second temple. Now in the New Testament, 
that second temple is really renovated. And sometimes you may in your reading read about a third uh, temple. But uh, uh, generally you'll read about the second temple being the one Zerubbabel built. And we'll talk about the, 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 the uh, temple that Herod built. And then to get to that third point of uh, God being in charge, and now we can put up this, this point, and that is, when Jesus came, it's all changed. You remember that Jesus said this temple is going to be destroyed and there's a new temple that's going to be built. And that temple has been built and it has existed from the time of Christ's ascension and it'll exist until the end of time. So that's the three ages of worship. Before Moses, during the time of Moses in the Old Testament, and then New Testament worship. Now let's go back and you'll, you may find some of this interesting. There's some, there some real interesting pictures uh, that, we'll, that we'll put on the screen. I think you know of what the tabernacle means. The word tabernacle means tent. And so uh, when Peter says, let us build three tabernacles here, what's he saying? Let's put up three tents. Let's stay here a while, one for Jesus and one for Moses and one for Elijah. I think that means Peter, James, and John are going to sleep outside. The best I, best I figured that went out. And that's not, what was, that's not what was being happened. But it literally means tent. And it was a beautiful, beautiful structure. It had to be movable. And we spent some time in a lesson here one time talking about the weight of those wooden boards that were carried. They were carried on ox carts. Uh, I don't know if Dirk is here tonight. I remember talking to Dirk about this and about the, the weight of, the, of those pieces of wood, the acacia wood of which it was built and every, everything and some of the inner construction of it because it had been massively heavy, and so it was moved on ox cars. But they could take it down, reassembled it. And, uh, but uh, it had a courtyard that was around the outside of it. Now, one of the interesting things was that when they dedicated that tabernacle, the Spirit of God, the cloud, came down and sat over the tabernacle. And so there was a manifestation of that cloud. Uh, I'd never thought about this until uh, developing this lesson. Wonder what that, that uh, cloud looked like at night. And so in an artist, go ahead and put up the next picture. The, the artist shows what it looked like at night when there was a pillar of fire over it. They had uh, street lights because encamped around the outside of that were the tribes. And each of them, there were specific sides that each of the tribes sat around. And so those tents that are out there are, are not really good representation of, of the, how large the tribes would be because some of those tribes had, uh, you know, uh, 30,000 members of, of those tribes. And so if you, if you think about it being tents just immediately on the outside, and some have suggested that perhaps those, those, those tents there were intended for, uh, uh, for the priest and those who were s serving inside that place. Let's look at an aerial view of the tabernacle. This is what we think of when we think of the tabernacle, but that's not what they saw. They saw all of those curtains and all of the colors of it, and so uh, uh, it, was, it was a building, it was a tent. But it had, on the outside, it had the courtyard and those rectangles around the outside, three rectangles on each side represent three times four is the 12 tribes, and so that's tribally where each of them were, uh, were fit. But I don't like to get things too busy because you won't be able to see anything. The important thing to see is that altar that's on the outside. There was an altar uh, for animal sacrifice. It was made of bronze, and it was at least overlaid with bronze. 
And um, it's where the animal sacrifices were offered. There was the morning sacrifice and there was the evening sacrifice. In the New Testament time, while they, uh, the Bible shows us that when Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, was serving in the temple because the priest only got to serve once every, once every two years, and it was his turn to, worship, to, to be serving in the temple, and uh, he, only had to get, he only got to do that once every 24 months, and when he goes in and the, and the angel appears to him, the people outside were praying. And so you get the New Testament and you hear about the hour of prayer. And that's a new, because that's when the Jews came together. And isn't it amazing that we have a song that says sweet hour of prayer. And I'm sure the, the basis of that song is, 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 is built around this, this aspect of it. But uh, they, it, and then there was a, a basin there where the priests would wash themselves. Now, that's the way the tabernacle was. There was a place where animal sacrifices were made. There was a place where the priests bathed themselves, washed themselves before they went into the temple itself. Now, the temple was much, much smaller than this room. That temple was only um, uh, 30 feet wide. Well, I suspect it's close to 30 feet. Dirk, you'll have to shake in your head and nod and everything. And then it was, uh, it was, uh, 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 it, it was 30, it was 20 cubit. Well, the other part of it, well, it was 10 cubits wide and it was 30 cubits long, which would be 45 feet, which will get you all the way to the back of uh, uh, 30 cubits would, would, would be uh, 45 feet. And so it's, it's about 60 feet from that camera to the screen. Wasn't big at all. Had two rooms in it. In the front room, there was a golden candlestick. Down on the south side of that, for the temple always, tabernacle and temple always faced toward the east. Morning sun came in. And so down on the south side of it uh, was where the labor, or pardon me, the table of showbread was found. Candlestick on the upper part, and uh, the uh, labor down uh, the the uh, candlestick down on the bottom, or maybe it's the other way around. And then there was an altar of incense. And every day, they went in and burned incense to God. Now the back room was 15 feet by 15 feet. It was separated by a veil. And so when the Bible says the veil of the temple was a torn in two when Jesus died from the top to the bottom, that's the veil that was torn. Uh, in the temple that was there in the first century, this veil weighed 300 pounds and it was five inches thick. To give you some idea of the size of this veil and the weight of this veil, in the temple that was there uh, in the first century. But they only went in this back room, 15 feet by 15 feet, one day a year. And only one man allowed, was allowed ever to go into that back room. And that was the high priest. And inside that back room is where they kept the ark that contained the Ten Commandments. And so once a year, they would go in there, and that was on the holiest day of the year, the most sober day in the, in the Jewish calendar today, Yom Kippur. It was the 10th day of the seventh month, and uh, the priest went in, and he offered a sacrifice first for his own sins, and then for the sins of the people. One year later, God remembered their sins on that day, and so they had to go and make an atonement. It was the Day of Atonement, one of, the, one of the holy feast days of the year. Now then, let's get away from the tabernacle and talk about Solomon's temple. Now that's a, some idea about how large Solomon's temple was. Uh, he obviously increased the size of it, but he kept the same proportions in relation to it. 
and uh, the, uh, the, the temple faced toward the east, and that wall there became a part of the outer wall when Solomon built that. Now, the, this tabernacle is really, or this temple is really, really amazing. There's another slide. Let's go ahead and look at it. That, that's an artist's rendition of it. Uh, if you'd like to see something that will truly impress you is at the um, uh, event of the, the place up in Orlando called Bible Lands. I believe that's the name of that. And they've got the entire city of Jerusalem laid out. And when they get to the New Testament temple, it covered more than uh, uh, a third of the city. In fact, Solomon, uh, the temple that Herod, Herod built, covered 600 acres. Now you've got to think about how big the temple in Jerusalem was. It covered 600 acres. And uh, I don't know how much 600 acres are. I do know out at Palm Beach Country State where I live, there are 710 one-acre lots out there. That's Palm Beach Country Estates. You go to the end of Dollar Ross, and then you just keep going for, you know, for a long, long way, more than a mile to get to, to the far side. That was the temple in the first century. But let's talk about the grandeur of Solomon's temple, and then we'll come back and talk a little bit about Herod's temple. The grandeur of Solomon's temple was it was planned by David, and he wanted to build the temple. In fact, he asked Nathan the prophet, this is in 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 7, if he could build that temple for God. And Nathan says, and this is a very loose paraphrase, I don't see any reason you shouldn't do it. Go ahead and do it. And before Nathan got outside of David's pl the place of residence, where he got out of David's palace, God came down and told Nathan, you go back and tell David he's not allowed to build the tabernacle, build the temple. But he gathered all of the materials for it and the gold that was there for it. And it was an amazing, an amazing temple in and of, uh, of itself. In fact, the cedars of Lebanon and some of those trees were massively huge in biblical times, were brought from far north, north of uh, Palestine. Above Palestine, you get in the area of Syria, and the king of Syria was Hiram. The Bible talks about how those cedars of Lebanon were cut down, pulled from those mountainous areas that's up there, if I can say Golan Heights, to give you some idea of things you'll hear about on the news, the Arabs shooting from the Golan Heights a little bit farther, and then that's where those cedars were, and they dragged those, those trees down all the way over to the Mediterranean Sea. The Bible shows they made barges out of them. They floated those large cedars all the way down from, uh, you know, uh, more than 100 miles all the way down from uh, uh, northern Palestine, north of Palestine, all the way down to where Jerusalem was, and then drug those things from sea level up to a level of over 2,000 feet up mountainous sides, mountain sides, and those cedars were the ones that were used to build it. The interesting thing is, the beauty of this place is, uh, uh, is, is described in, in these ways. Uh, uh, description is found in many Bible encyclopedias. And a brief description can be found in any good Bible encyclopedia. A very simple one, it's not pricey at all, but it's free if you want to download it. It's one that I use when I'm looking at something I trust. It's called Smith's Bible Dictionary. If you want a larger want description of that, then uh, read, you'll be able to read something like ISBE, and that's a free thing you can download to your smartphone. It's called ISBE, 
International Standard Bible Encyclopedia. I highly recommend it. It's a four-volume set. It's got, it's got 6,000 pages in it, and I've got, I've got an ISBE right here on my phone. It's a, it just goes in detail, and you've got so much information in it, you can't find anything in it. That's why I like the Reader's Digest version called Smith's Bible Dictionary, because you can really begin to grasp it when you read that description of it. Now then, the Bible tells us how much gold there was in Solomon's temple. In 1 Chronicles chapter 22 and verse 14, Solomon, David left to Solomon 1,000 talents of gold. Pardon me. 100,000 talents of gold. You want to get your phone out now? I'll tell you how many pounds of gold that is. And I know that the weight of gold is a little bit different by about an ounce, you know, of some other measurements of, of weight and everything. But if you will take 16 ounces in a pound and understand there are 2,000 pounds in a ton, to give you some idea, the amount of gold in 100,000 talents of gold is 3,000 tons. So if you'll multiply 3,000 by 2,000 pounds in the tons, that gets you to and then multiply that, you know what gold sells for? And then you got to multiply it by 16. Then you got to multiply that. Gold today is worth $2,000 an ounce. Your phone is not big enough to tell me how much gold was in that temple. Now then, that verse in 2 Chronicles tells you that he also gave him a million talents of silver. And a talent of silver is 30,000 tons. Let's just take the tonnage, 33,000 tons of metal. That is an unbelievable amount of gold. They overlaid everything in it. And there was a description at one time in, in biblical times that there was so much gold, they made all their plates and pans out of it, and it, it was as common as, ordi or as, as ordinary things. Well, we're running out of time. Let's talk about, let's talk about that temple that, that, uh, that, 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 uh, that was built by Herod. Zerubbabel, they come back in Zerubbabel today and they rebuild the, tap, the second tabernacle. It's not nearly as massive. In fact, those who were old enough to have seen the first tabernacle when the second was built wept because of it. And it, evidently the weeping was not just weeping of joy, but also because it did not have the grandeur of Solomon. Do you wonder why Nebuchadnezzar came and destroyed the temple in Jerusalem? Do you know why Solomon's temple should have been one of the seven wonders of the ancient world? It's not, but it should have been. Now, I don't know who, who, makes, who makes up those numbers and everything. Then Herod comes along, and when Jesus said, destroy this temple, and in three days I will rebuild this temple. They thought he was talking about the temple itself, but he was talking about the temple of his body, and their response was, Herod has spent 46 years renovating Zerubbabel's temple. And you can get descriptions of that. And if, you're, if you are amazed at these numbers, then just, get, just use, your, use your cell phone. Young people, you'd find this a real interesting trip to make. I guarantee you is to just see how much dirt they had to move to level off 
on the mountain top. Mount Zion was there, Mount Moriah was there, and to make all of that ground level, they had to either cut the tops of the mountains down to make it all level, and imagine making 600, or nearly seven, near, over 600 acres level and the amount of dirt, they, and that's what Herod did. And uh, he, he's the one who just magnified it and magnified it, and Herod's temple had to be at least five times larger than Solomon's temple. That's something I read today. So when Jesus came to that temple and said, not one stone of this temple will be left upon another, he was dealing with something that was so magnificent. In fact, uh, uh, doing research about this, whenever you, you're building something that weighs as much as, uh, as that temple would have weighed, the one that Herod built, they dug down to solid rock and they had to dig down uh, 20 cubits to hit bedrock. Maybe it's 20 meters, 20, which would be 20 yards, which would be more than 20 cubits to find bedrock. And some of those stones in the temple weighed, weighed 20,000 pounds. And when Jesus said, when Jesus said, not one stone of this temple will be, will be uh, left upon another. When that temple was destroyed by the Roman army that came down, they leveled it to the ground and not one stone of it stayed upon top of another. Well, what happened after that temple was no more? Well, there was a, another temple. And that temple had been in existence. It started on the day of Pentecost, and that was the church. You talk about the fact that in that temple, you've got the church of Jesus Christ is the temple of God, and these verses of Scripture describe this so emphatically. That's us. Imagine being a high priest. And the honor it would be. Imagine it, the honor of being what Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, was. Not a high priest, there was only one per year, one per lifetime. And that was just to be a priest. Jesus says, Revelation chapter 1, you are a kingdom of priests. I want you to think that through. If it was an honor to be the high priest like Aaron was, who carried, his, carried the blood of an animal into the very presence of God, there's another high priest, Jesus, the high priest, who carried his blood into the temple of God, into the presence of God, into heaven itself. But then there are all these other priests. And every Christian is a priest. We are a, if you are a, king, a citizen in the kingdom, you are in the priesthood of the church. And here's how the Bible describes worship. Let us offer up the fruit of our lips. That's praising God. And it says that in the sight of God is a holy sacrifice. Amen. All that's in Hebrews chapter 13. It's an honor to sing to God. It's an honor to pray to God. 
because as God focused on the sacrifices of Cain and Abel and sacrifices of Noah and Abraham, and as God focused on the Day of Atonement, the sacrifice that was made for the atonement of the sins of all people. He focused on the, the death of the high priest, Jesus, the Lamb of God, and he focuses on the fruit of our lips, a, sac a sweet-smelling Savior, a sacrifice acceptable to God every time we sing together and pray together. Many tabernacles, two temples, and one kingdom of temples, and that's us. Let's worship him and think soberly every time we do it. You're dismissed.